Well, well, good morning. You, you know, before I get started, uh, I, I need to choose uh, three of you. Ken, I want to choose you. And um, Steve, could I choose you? Uh, and Jeff, Jeff, I want to choose you. Now, I don't need you now, but I'll let you know. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. You know, when Patty and I lived in Little Rock, Arkansas, I drove the same way to the office every day. And along the way, there was this gigantic, huge oak tree. I mean, it was strong and stately. Uh, Its branches, they just stretched out boldly as if to beckon you under its shelter. I mean, its form, it communicated strength and stability. And then one day, I found out it was all a lie. I drove by, and that huge oak tree had fallen over. And what I could see was rot all in the inside of that tree. I mean, you, you couldn't see the rot from the outside. It had been there for years. You see, that tree said it was healthy, but in reality, it wasn't. You know, there are a lot of people and a lot of churches that are just like that tree. Strong and stately on the outside, but dead and rotten on the inside. Appearances, well, they can be deceiving. Well, what keeps a person headed in the right direction in his walk with God? And what keeps a church uh, bold and fresh and winsome? I think the best way to answer that question is to look at a church that was. In fact, we want to embark on a study this morning of a church that modeled a vibrant walk with God. This was a church that was located in the city of Thessalonica. In fact, if you wouldn't mind, turn with me in the Bible to the New Testament, to the book of 1 Thessalonians, as we begin in chapter 1, verse 1. You can follow along as I read. It begins this way, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, uh, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now the way Paul begins this letter makes perfect sense to me. Uh, It's better than the way we do it today. In fact, I got a letter from someone not too long ago. It said, Dear Doug, I don't mean to complain, but... And I immediately turned it over to see who wrote it. I mean, the way Paul does it here makes more sense to me. He puts his name up front. He declares himself as the author. But notice, he doesn't tell his audience that he's an apostle. That's unusual. Nine other letters he communicates, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. But he doesn't hear, and you're left to wonder why. Well, this church didn't need to be confronted about the misuse of spiritual gifts like the church in Corinth. And it didn't need to be corrected about legalism like the churches of Galatia. This was a healthy church. In fact, two times in this book, Paul's going to tell them to excel still more. But notice, he identifies two other men that are with him. There's Silvanus and Timothy. You see, after Paul's release from prison in Philippi, he takes Silas. Silvanus is his Roman name. So Silas and Timothy head with him uh, west to Thessalonica. And, And while he's there, he ends up speaking in the synagogue for three consecutive Saturdays. Uh, And uh, Acts 17 tells us the details, and it says that a great multitude of devout Greeks and many of the leading women joined Paul and Silas, and they ended up planting this church in Thessalonica. So Paul made some significant inroads with some very influential people who came to faith in Christ, and we're told in Acts that they began meeting in the home of a guy named Jason. But a small number of local Jews were upset with what Paul was doing. And so they hired a bunch of ruthless men uh, to create some havoc and spread rumors about Paul. Have you ever had someone 
gossip or spread a rumor about you. Remember in my church in Colorado, I had a leader uh, began saying things that maligned me and began saying them publicly. I remember how much it hurt and how angry I was and how disappointed I felt. Not just me, but my wife, my entire family, and and there was everything within me. I was tempted to want to set the record straight. I, I mean, let's let's get this the truth out. But I did what Paul ends up doing here. He focuses on building God's kingdom in the midst of false accusations. And he lets God set the record straight for him. Now, now these ruthless men, they end up storming Jason's house looking for Paul. And when they don't find him there, they end up taking Jason out in the streets and then they present him to the authorities in the city. And their complaint is, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. So this church at Thessalonica was born out of persecution. So Jason's arrested. He's put in prison. But he's released when Paul uh, agrees to leave town peaceably. But Paul's heart somehow remains connected to these people. He's enamored with the people in this church. So Paul and Timothy and Silas head 40 miles further west and they go to a little town called Berea. But the mercenaries end up following Paul there and creating havoc. So Paul has to leave Berea as well. And he leaves Silas and Timothy there uh, in Berea. And Paul heads south. He goes all the way south to Athens and then eventually to Corinth. But Paul was fascinated and intrigued by this church in Thessalonica. So what he tells Timothy is, I want you to go back and visit that church and then come find me in in Corinth, rendezvous with me there. So a year later, Timothy, after going to the church in Thessalonica, comes to Corinth and looks for Paul and finds him there and gives him this encouraging report and it was that report that compels Paul to write this letter. So what was it about these people that gripped Paul's heart so? Well, Thessalonica was a strategic city. I mean, it was located on the Ignatian Way. Uh, it's, it's that highway that connected Rome with the Orient. But uh, it wasn't their location that captured Paul's heart. I, I think it was these people's sincerity in heart for God. I mean, did you notice that they live in Thessalonica, but that's not where Paul finds them. I mean, notice what it says. They were the Thessalonians, but they were in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The emphasis isn't on physical location as much as a spiritual one. I wonder where you see yourself this morning. I mean, do you see yourself in church? Do you see yourself in Cincinnati? Maybe you see yourself in a certain occupation. Paul would say that your physical location isn't as important as your spiritual one. In fact, a number of years ago, I had the privilege of visiting the governor's mansion in Arkansas. Now, I didn't know Governor Huckabee at all. But as I drove up to the gate, I punched the button on the intercom. A voice said, may I help you? And I said, I'm here to see Don Bingham. The gate immediately flew open. You see, Don Bingham was the assistant to Governor Huckabee. He was, he was his right-hand man, and Don was a friend of mine. So the voice instructed me to drive around to the back of the governor's mansion and park where the governor parked. So I did, and I parked next to the governor's brand-new bass boat. And when I got out of my car, a state trooper met me and escorted me up the back porch right past the governor's duck waders that were still wet, and his duck call. I was tempted to blow it, but I decided not to. <laughs> he es- escorted me through the back door, down a couple halls, and I sat in a chair and waited for my friend Don to meet me. Well, Don and his wife Nancy introduced me to the governor Huckabee, to the governor Huckabee's wife, and they took me on a tour of the governor's mansion, and I saw all sorts of interesting and fascinating things. After the tour, we sat down for lunch in 
the governor's uh, dining room. I said at the governor's table. I ate the governor's food in a room that had the governor's $100,000 Persian rug on the floor and an original Picasso on the wall. I mean, it was amazing. You see, since I knew Don Bingham, I had access to what Don Bingham had access to. Now, that's what that little phrase, in Christ, refers to here in the text. Hey, Paul knows that no matter what your physical location is, you, we all have the privilege of our spiritual location since we're in Christ. Now, it didn't start out that way. I mean, we started out in Adam, separated from God, and spiritually dead. But now that we've put our faith in Christ, become a Christ follower, we have been removed from Adam and placed in Christ. It means we have access to the things that Christ has access to. And I think that is what's at the foundation of this church's sincerity. I mean, notice as well that Paul greets them with the phrase, grace to you in peace. Did you know you can't have peace without having grace? I mean, without grace, there can be no peace. But because of grace, God's unmerited favor, there can now be peace. Now, now peace, is, I mean, or grace is a word that really baffles us. I mean, it, it, it confuses us because it goes against our natural inclination that in the face of injustice, some price must be paid. I mean, a murderer can't go scot-free. Heavens forbid. A child molester can't say, I just felt like doing it. No. Now, some of you are old enough to remember the movie, The Last Emperor. It came out in 87, and it won nine Academy Awards. It was a movie about a little boy who becomes the very last emperor of China. And he lives this magical life with a thousand eunuch servants at his beck and call. One day, his brother asked him, what happens when you do something wrong? And the young lad said, well, when I do something wrong, one of my servants is punished. And to demonstrate, he pushes a vase off the platform and it smashes into a bazillion pieces. And one of the servants is severely beaten. Now, in Paul's theology, Jesus has, res has reversed this ancient practice. In Jesus' economy, when the servant errs, the king ends up being punished. You see, grace is free only because the giver himself has paid a severe price and been punished. Grace means there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. But grace also means there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. Now, that's the kind of king we've all longed for, the kind of king that we desire to serve. And it's this king that loves you Dearly, I think this church understood all of that. So, so Paul writes, as he writes, he's reflecting on what God has done for these people. And, and then he thanks God for what they've done in response to God's amazing grace. So what exactly is Paul thankful for? Well, look at verse 2. It says, we give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. I think Paul is saying that he's thankful for their winsome authenticity. Years ago, when my grandmother passed away, we had to go through our house and have an estate sale and take the things and divvy them up that we wanted. And we, we found all sorts of fascinating things in my grandmother's house. She'd lived there for 65 years. I found Confederate money. I found coins dating back to the 1800s and 1700s. But the most fascinating thing I found was this in an old file cabinet. Uh, this is a newspaper from Memphis. 
It's dated April the 17th, 1865. That's a significant date in our nation's history. That was the day Lincoln was assassinated. And this article, or this newspaper article, uh, tells the whole story. Now, when I say uh, this is an original, I'm saying it's the real thing, that it's authentic. There's nothing false about it at all. Now, Paul, in looking at this church at Thessalonica, he considers them to be the real thing. I mean, they were authentic, meaning there's no deception. There are no religious words that sound pious but lack substance. I mean, when you're authentic, you, you live who you are. You tell the truth. You admit failure. You admit weakness. Uh, for them, authenticity meant that what they did and how they lived corresponded to what God was doing in them. And their life was an honest and accurate reflection of God's work for them. And as a result, there was a freshness about this people, a, a freshness that came across to others as a winsomeness. So it makes me want to ask the question, so what did they look like? How did they act? Well, Paul gives us a picture. Did you notice the three phrases in verse 3? Work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope. Each one of those phrases is pregnant with meaning. I mean, it's interesting the way they're constructed in the Greek text They're constructed in a way that the emphasis is not on the faith, but what the faith produces. It's not on the love, it's on what the love prompts. It's it's not on the hope, it's on what the hope inspires. I mean, faith, hope, and love are important, but the emphasis here is on the work, the labor, and the patience. In other words, what God has been working into their hearts gets put into practice by these people. I mean, this church was not lazy. It it wasn't uh, lethargic. It wasn't passive. They were eager to join God in what He was doing. They didn't hesitate. I mean, their eagerness can be seen in their work of faith. It means that they took their faith and they linked it with works. And as a result, they grew spiritually. I mean, this church took what it believed and put it into action. And then that next phrase, labor of love. They were enthusiastic about their love for God and they linked it with their labor of engaging with God and what he was doing in other people's lives. And as a result, people came to know Christ. You see, when love is, is um, or when love and labor are linked together, that's a powerful force. Uh, Labor without love, well, that becomes a toil. But when your labor is motivated by love, it becomes a joy. You see, these people, they didn't serve out of guilt or out of ought to and obligation. They volunteered out of a heart of love. And I believe Paul saw that and others saw it. And then lastly, they were eager to take the hope that, they had, that they'll see Jesus face to face one day and link it with patience to produce this kind of endurance that would allow them to bear up under whatever difficult circumstance came their way. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that's an attractive church. I'd like to know more about them. So what made them so eager to join God in what He was doing? Well, I think these people understood two things. First of all, they understood they were chosen by God for this. I mean, look at the next verse, verse 4. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Election refers to the fact that God chose them. Now, I chose several of you as I began this message. How did that make you feel? You a little nervous? A couple of you were looking down, hoping I wouldn't choose you. What's he going to make me do? I mean, am I going to get in front of people? Now, what if I told you you were chosen to receive $1,000? Well, that makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? That impacts your eagerness, doesn't it? Well, these 
This church knew it was chosen. It was chosen by God. Uh, and knowing they were chosen by God impacted their eagerness. They were eager to join with Him. Uh, this church understood they were chosen by God to partner with Him. And one of the greatest adventures in all the ages, the expansion of God's kingdom among the Gentiles. Now, Paul tells us that they were chosen, but that's not all. He also tells us they were convinced. Look at verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Now, notice this partnership came with power. The word power is the Greek word dunamis, which we get our English word dynamite. But notice as well, it came with the Holy Spirit and with conviction. That's what the word assurance refers to. So their eagerness came from the fact they knew God had chosen them and they were convinced of the power of God. And as a result, they were eager to partner with God in what He wanted. So this church was eager, but notice verse 6, they were also exemplary. Verse 6 says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. Now, years ago when my boys were small, uh, in the summer I'd be out mowing the lawn, and occasionally I would look behind me, and one of them would have their little toy lawn mower pushing right along behind me, mimicking what Dad was doing. That's what the word follower means. It means to mimic, to imitate, to copy. In fact, it was Albert Einstein who said this, Setting an example is not the main means of influencing another. It's the only means. And you need to know that this was no mere superficial imitation. They were mimicking Paul and how he handled stress and persecution. And as a result, they became examples. Now, throughout all of Macedonia, that's the region around Thessalonica. And Achaia, that's the region around Corinth. Did you know the word example used there literally means to make an impression? Like you take this clay and I would make an impression of my thumbprint. So, so th this church was really an impression, a, a, a living example of what it means to engage with God from the heart. And so God came around them and engaged their hearts as well. You know, the great pianist, uh, Paderewski, was scheduled for a concert. And moments before he was supposed to take the stage, a, a young lad sitting on the front row who was enamored with the big grand piano up on stage slipped away from his mom's oversight and made his way up on stage and began to play chopsticks on the piano. Well, the crowds just stared in disbelief. Many gasped. How dare he touch the piano of the great Paderewski, much less play chopsticks, and they began to boo. Well, Paderewski, who was just off stage, noticed what was happening. And he walked out on stage, coming up behind the young boy, sitting on his piano bench, and he put his arms around the young lad and he whispered in his ear, keep playing, son, don't stop, keep playing. And the great Paderewski played a complimentary melody to what the young lad was playing. And the auditorium fell silent. And when they finished, they gave the young boy a standing ovation. You, you see, this church faced many difficulties in life, but they didn't give up. They didn't throw in the towel. They kept playing. They would mimic their mentors, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and how they walked with God. They knew that the God of the universe was going to come around them. 
as they continued to trust him and play a complimentary melody that could be observed by those around them that gave this church a significant influence and caused people to look at them and say, wow, I want to live like that. I want to be like those guys. I wonder what people say when they look at our lives. I mean, do they look at us and say, man, I want to live like that? Or do they look at you and say, I, oh, I could never live like that? I mean, that's nuts, the way that person lives. That's one of the things I've loved about this church. We've taken the weirdness out of Christianity, the weird things, and we have put in a winsomeness, and you live in a way, in a culture, that impacts them by your, your kindness, your winsomeness, and your words. And this church was just like that. So they were eager. They were exemplary. But they were also enthusiastic. Look at verse 8. For from you the word of God has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. Now that is amazing. Did you know that phrase sounded forth literally means to amplify? Like someone would amplify a trumpet so that everyone could hear? Now, this church was not tooting its own horns. I mean, they were trumpeting the good news of the gospel. Uh, They were living in a way that was winsome, and their influence traveled long past them into all of Macedonia and even Achaia. And as Paul puts it, to every place their faith towards God has gone forth. I mean, imagine it like this. Paul travels down to Athens. He strikes up a conversation with somebody and the conversation moves toward Jesus. And the people he's talking to said, Jesus, yeah, we heard that name from the, those guys from Thessalonica. I mean, we were talking to them last week. Paul kind of scratches his head. So that's, that's amazing. He heads on to Corinth. He's, he's in the marketplace. He ends up mentioning the name Jesus and somebody interrupts him and said, yeah, the, that lady... Uh, that, that came from Thessalonica. That she was a Thessalonian. She talked about that same... Is, she, is that the same one she was talking about? Yeah, Paul saw this church, his name, turn up everywhere as he was engaging people. You see, this church may have been small and they may have been young, but they had this winsome influence throughout the whole territory. They had a presence in the area. You see, size does not determine impact. What determines impact is winsomeness and heart. And this church had both. So this church was eager, exemplary. They they were enthusiastic, but notice, lastly, they were expectant, verse 9. But they themselves declared concerning us what matter of entry we had to you. And so you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Notice Paul said they turned from idols. Did you know you can make an idol out of just about anything? I mean, your children can become an idol in, in real subtle ways. They can, those little ones can begin dominating your life so that your life revolves around them completely, and they become an idol. Grandchildren can become an idol. I mean, your, your job, your work can become your God. Many things can become idols. I mean, hobbies, retirement can grip your heart to the point that they become an idol. Now, none of those things are wrong. No, not, nothing about that's wrong. But does that thing possess you? It's not wrong to possess them. It becomes wrong when it begins to possess you, and that's when it becomes an idol. Now, now notice how God is described. He, he's described as living and true. Idols are dead. God is alive. Idols are unreal. God, He's genuine. But, but trusting this God who's living and true means taking Him at His word. And He promised He would return one day. And this church was expectant of that. 
In fact, I remember my freshman year at Mississippi State. I took freshman chemistry. Wasn't doing so good. At the same time, the book Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey came out about the second coming of Christ, and I was reading that. And as I read it, I began to, th- to see that Christ's return could happen at any moment. It- it's imminent. In fact, I became convinced that it was probably going to happen before my chemistry final. <laughs> so I didn't study the whole semester. Four days before my final, I had to change my theology or I was going to fail chemistry. Now, uh, that's where I began to understand that waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. Waiting actually means being prepared. That's what Paul has in mind when he says to wait for the sun from heaven. In the same way you await a visitor in your home, you are to await Christ's return. So what do you do? You prepare everything for that visitor's coming. I mean, you arrange the stuff uh, for the visitor in the room. You plan activities. You clear your schedule. You accommodate them as much as possible. You arrange things so that they begin feeling at home when they visit. Now, that's what Paul is talking about here. And he's going to go into great detail on Jesus' second coming later on in this book. So this was a church that was, well, it was eager, it was exemplary, it was uh, enthusiastic, and it was expectant. In other words, they were biblical in content and authentic in their context. Now, that's a powerful, attractive force, especially in a culture It's like that tree I passed on my way to work in Little Rock. Where people are one way on the outside, but they can be totally different on the inside. Father, thank you for putting in the heart of this church a desire to engage people around us. May may we become even more winsome in engaging with this culture and the people around us. May they see a life that's lived in a way that woos them to the throne of grace. And they can find the peace that Paul talked about here. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you for coming. If you you came prepared to give, Uh, offering boxes are actually out in the hall. We make it a little hard to give here, and you can find them on the left side of the hall as you leave. If this is your first time at Horizon or have questions about what's going on here, please drop by the hearth room, third door on the left, and we would love to engage with you there. Thanks for coming, and we'll see you back next week.